a brief summary of what we'll cover today. Um, first, we'll just start with an overview of both products. We'll touch on pricing quickly and licensing. Then we'll move in to cover some of the details of the microsurvey features that we offer. Brian's going to take over and share his thoughts on the software. Um, and then we'll wrap up uh, to discuss our support and training options. And then at the end, we'll open the floor to questions from all of our viewers. Next slide there, Jim. Thanks. So uh, before we begin, uh, we'd like to start out with a quick viewer poll to get some feedback from all of you. Um, we'd like to know exactly why you're interested in embedded CAD and in CAD. So you can choose more than one answer here. Jim's going to initiate the poll and you can answer in the uh, interface that should be up on your screen now. And then when we're done, we'll share the results. There it is. Some people still thinking about their answers. Okay, and I think a, st a few people are still working on their coffee, so we'll just end it at 85% done. I will close that, and then we'll share the results. So everybody can review how everyone answered. Okay, so pretty, pretty even distribution between uh, current CAD solutions or other CAD solutions, options one and two. Thanks very much for answering those questions. It really helps us to know more about what our audience uh, is interested in. and always helps to give us guidance, and it's kind of interesting for everyone to see. Something that I failed to mention at the start was that um, we have a chat line and we have handouts available for audience members. Uh, the handout is a PDF of the PowerPoint that we're going through. Go ahead and grab a copy of that if you'd like. And also use the chat line to ask any questions. There will be uh, a, a time for questions right at the end, and uh, we look forward to answering them. You can ask questions of both our panelists or staff members. And if we do happen to miss one of your questions, we'll get back to you after the, the event is over. So James, you're going to tell us a bit about Embedded CAD 2018, and, and it'll be Perfect. aimed at people who just like to learn about the product, and James will also touch on things that are new with 2018. All right, Jim, if you just want to bring the presentation back up as well, I'm still viewing the uh, poll results. Thank you for the reminder. Here we go. Perfect. Okay, so uh, thanks for the feedback, everybody. Um, a common question that I'm asked when discussing our products is, what are embedded CAD and NCAD, and what are the difference between the two? Microsurvey is probably best known for our flagship software, Microsurvey CAD. However, what we want to discuss today is uh, other options that we offer um, which are AutoCAD powered solutions. So Embedded CAD is a standalone package, so it does not require any existing version of AutoCAD to be installed on your computer. It's built on the latest AutoCAD OEM 2018 engine, and we kind of get bragging rights here because we are one of the first companies to release a software solution built on this new engine. InCAD, on the other hand, is a plugin for your existing copy of AutoCAD, so it does require you to have an AutoCAD license installed. It has all the same microsurvey features as Embedded CAD, but it installs on top of AutoCAD 2018, Civil 3D 2018, and AutoCAD Map 3D 2018. Move to the next slide there, Jim. Why Embedded CAD? Um, 
I guess th those of us in the surveying and mapping industry clearly have specific requirements of our office software. Uh, this is mainly due to the fact that we deal with uh, mainly geospatial data. So here at Microsurvey, we aim to offer software that allows users to manage this data using a wide range of tools which may not be available in a purely CAD-specific product. Embedded CAD is one solution that we offer that will allow you to complete everything from field data import to final plan submission and nearly everything in between. Obviously AutoCAD is a major player in the CAD industry, so this gives a, a great advantage to embedded CAD users. For example, this year AutoCAD updated the 2018 DWG format, and since embedded CAD is built on the latest AutoCAD OEM engine, uh, we're able to fully support that new format. This is going to eliminate conflicts when sharing information between departments or clients who may be using other Autodesk products. This then leads into ease of use. So many drafters and CAD operators are trained on or familiar with AutoCAD products. So managers who may be interested in, in, in embedded CAD or in CAD may be concerned with the impact of switching platforms or overcoming le a learning curve but they can really rest easy knowing that they're moving into a very familiar environment. Aspects like visual layout, command names are going to be common amongst the platforms. Uh, if you're accustomed to using AutoCAD or a similar product in your daily routine, you should find that you're instantly productive when you get into embedded CAD. What does uh, InCAD offer? Many of my comments from the previous slide apply to InCAD as well. The main point here is the fact that you're gaining those microsurvey tools that allow you to process and manage your geospatial data. I know, for example, there are quite a few engineering firms out there that would have a license of Civil 3D because it's got a lot of really great tools that are needed for other aspects of their business. But they may also require a completely separate solution, such as Microsurvey CAD, just to handle their surveying information. So InCAD would be a really great option for you because it's going to simplify that workflow and remove the need to maintain several software packages. You can really complete all the processing, as I put in the slide, under one roof. Um, and it's really going to enhance, enhance your surveying aspects of, of your work but you're going to maintain that existing proficiency with the product that you already use. So basically, we worry about all the compatibility issues so you don't have to. I just want to briefly talk about our licensing options and pricing. I think it's really best summed up by the graph in the upper right. So here we have a comparison of the approximate cost of an embedded CAD perpetual license plus maintenance versus two subscription services. In blue, we would have a $2,400 a year subscription. In green, a $1,400 a year. And in orange, we have Embedded CAD. You'll notice the initial investment for Embedded CAD is slightly higher, but as soon as that perpetual license kicks in, you start to see savings almost immediately. So after five years, there is a pretty significant difference in the overall cost to you. We also offer an optional annual maintenance program, and this is for both embedded CAD and in CAD. I've shown some details in the lower left. This is going to keep you up to date with each new release, so you'll be valid to install those as soon as they come out the door. We also offer two different product levels, standard and premium. Premium is going to give you site design and modeling features. Um, you can visit our website if you'd like to see a more detailed comparison of what both of those levels offer, um, or feel free to contact us as well, and we can go over that with you. Um, now I'll get into some of those microsurvey features that I've, I've been talking about briefly. Um, the first feature that I want to discuss is the coordinate geometry calculations. I know it's probably the least flashy and might not look as good on screen, but I know that a big part of a surveyor's job is to, to crunch through those calculations that are, that are necessary in the work that we do. So if we can make that easier for you, less stressful and quicker, then I think we're really on the right track. The COGO routines would include all of your traverse calcs, bearing and distance, distance, distance intersections, etc. 
Uh, it's been in our product line a long time, and I think it was initially designed, as I mentioned in the slide, so that you can have one hand on the keyboard and one hand on your plan. Everything's entered through the command line, and we've also got a uh, bunch of other handy tools that are going to help you complete your Kogo-related computations. And uh, Jim, if you just want to bring up that first video, the Kogo one. Coming over. Sorry for the delay. Here it is. Uh, it's not not the right one there, Jim. Here we go. Sorry about that. Perfect. So I'll just show you a quick demo here of how it can be computed. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Um, I've sped up the playback, so I, I don't expect you to watch every entry that I'm making. But just note that everything is being com com complete, uh, entered completely in the command line. And as I calc through the traverse, all the line work and labeling is being applied automatically. Uh, we can input, input curves as well. And as I'm calculating through, I, for example, finish off with a bearing-bearing uh, intersection. So once this lot is entered, um, we've got, as I said, all of our labeling, all of our line work is automatic, and it's, it's connected live. So as I open the um, coordinate database, you'll see that everything's already entered in, into the database and stored. If I make any changes to the coordinates or move a point, the line work is connected, it's going to update automatically, the labeling is going to update automatically. We've also got a point history to keep record of any changes that have been made. Um, so I've really only scratched the surface here with that demo, but it's just to show you that, that entering Traverse information in, in calcs is, is quick and comprehensive, um, and it's going to help you get through that process as easily as possible. I'll just go to the next slide, Jim, if you don't mind. Perfect. So obviously field data import and export options are very important in our line of work. Embedded CAD and NCAD uh, support such formats uh, as like a DVX for Captivate users. There's a streamlined import option for Field Genius software, our microsurvey option, as well as uh, many other field data import and export options. Um, including some older total station formats that may not be running current software. I won't list everything here, but please let us know if you'd like to learn a bit more about importing and exporting your specific field data type. Um, and I'm just going to bring up one more video example. So, Jim, that would be the uh, Leica DBX import. How am I doing? That's it. Okay. Um, So here I just import a Leica DBX file. First, I just need to choose the import option, browse for the file, and click import. We can see the Traverse editor here is opened up. Um, so we've got all my raw observations for the project. I can make any changes, like update instrument heights. As I zoom into the main part of the drawing, you'll see that much of the line work has already been completed. If I bring down the layers, you'll notice that the layering is set up automatically. And as I open the active coordinate editor again, you'll notice that all the points are, are stored in the database. So I'm really ready to start drafting now. Um, it's, it's that simple. You just have to choose the import option and find the file. I didn't have to do anything, anything much beyond that. So I'll just go back to that slide shortly, Jim. Okay. Um, as I mentioned in the video, um, Importing the, the data is one thing, but we also implement the Active Coordinate Editor and the Active Traverse Editor. So the Active Coordinate Editor is going to store all your point information. As I said before, it shows a point history. It's also going to allow for things like coordinate transformations, and you can even view your points quickly in Google Maps. The Active Traverse, on the other hand, is going to display all of your raw field observations. So you're not just relying on a coordinate value. You can make changes, like I mentioned, such as instrument heights. And anything that you update in the Traverse Editor is going to then update in the coordinate database. 
which is then going to update in the drawing. So it's all very interconnected and live. Any changes you make are going to be reflected throughout the software. We also offer the auto map, which is our own field to finish option. So this is a very powerful tool for automated line work and layering. It's fully integrated with our Field Genius software, but it can be set up based on field descriptions from whatever field data you may be uh, importing. The idea here is to cut down on drafting time spent connecting line work and adding symbols and things like that. So we can go next slide, Jim. Embedded CAD and NCAD Premium uh, offer the servicing and modeling options that I spoke of uh, earlier in the presentation. So things like contours, tins, volume calculations, these can all be generated and computed. The key note here is uh, uh, the ability to import and export land XML format. So this is going to allow you to share data amongst other AutoCAD products and other field software for further processing or stakeout. And that's a, that's a question we get asked a lot is about, about sharing data amongst different programs. And I've got one more quick example video to show you of our servicing. So here I just imported a text file of some topo shots on a, on a stockpile. I extracted the points and break lines to generate two surfaces so we could calculate the volume for example. And now I'm just going to quickly generate some contour lines that we could add to the final survey plan. The idea here is once the surfacing is set up, it's very easy to generate things like tins and contours and many of the modeling tasks. Now again, that's available in the premium license. So if you're interested in modeling or servicing, please check that out. And that's all I've got for now. Um, I guess we're gonna switch over to Brian Brown and Jim, I'll let you introduce Brian. I will. So we're honored to be joined by Brian Brown today. So uh, Brian, as I mentioned at the start, has been a longtime user of microsurvey. And uh, he uh, received his commission in 1982. He has uh, uh, enjoyed his entire career in the village of Whistler near Vancouver. And anybody who watched the Winter Olympics will remember Whistler. Um, Brian revealed that he's an enthusiastic skier, which probably doesn't surprise anyone. Um, but uh, Brian's been in touch with us for a long time and using our tools for a long time. And um, I, I had called Brian a few weeks ago to ask if he might like to join us for this webinar. And, and I had just asked him, um, would, you know, what is something that you like about microsurvey? And um, it, his idea was he thought that it would be quite valuable to go over one of his more complex projects that he's gone through with in, during his career and kind of contrast how he used to do things um, when he just worked with a pure CAD solution plus um, you know the appropriate software on the side and contrast that to how things work now, now that he's got a integrated CAD and um, surveying tool. So uh, he, he's given us a very interesting project that we're going to get a little bit of a tour of. So um, Brian, I'll get you to introduce yourself and, uh, oh, and sorry, I should have told a little bit about more about Brian. So he's been working since 1982. He is, um, he uh, had his own company for a long time. Uh, two and a half years ago, his company was acquired by McElhaney, which is a, a large firm in Western Canada, and he's still practicing. And uh, Brian was also recently elected the president of the Association of BC Land Surveyors. So Brian, thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, go ahead and add anything else about yourself and start telling us about this Stonebridge project. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, I'm glad to. Um, the photos that you see there on the PowerPoint are a couple of shots of views from some of the lots on this development that we did. This was a, a very high-end development. Um, the lots are currently valued between four and six million dollars. Um, some of the houses that we've laid out on the on the lots are quite complex. We've had some that we've laid out that have required up to 100 points uh, for a single family house. So fairly complex. Um, 
we could go to the next slide. Uh, here's a uh, yeah, go to the, yeah. Here's a shot from the GIS database showing the area for this development, Stonebridge Drive. Um, and uh, the next slide is an aerial of the area. You can see the same area in the middle. And this is Whistler. And uh, on the right, you can see where the uh, base of Whistler is at the south, the original base of Whistler. And uh, the next slide shows where I'm talking to you from in Function Junction, where our office is. So we could go to the next slide, Jim. Um, this uh, slide shows the original subdivision of this property, which was the result of a proposed zoning definition change. The property was zoned RR1, which is Rural Resource 1, or the most basic zone. And originally, RR1 zoning allowed minimum lot sizes of 20 acres. However, the municipality was going to change the definition of RR1 to only allow 100-acre parcels. So the original parcel was approximately 525 acres, so they only would have been allowed to create five lots. Instead, they beat the timing of the redefinition and created approximately 30 lots. It was a small portion of the overall parcel that had different zoning, allowing some smaller lots. Uh, we can go to the next slide, uh, Jim. So um, on this rot, lot, uh, plan, we dedicated roads. Uh, let's see. We could actually go back to the last plan. I'm sorry. Oh, oh no, no. Sure. That's right. That's right. I'm right. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, at the same time, um, there was a move afoot in BC to put in bypass roadways, which you can see along the lower part of this plan or the bottom of the slide, you might say, which is um, which is why this plan was prepared. A major problem, which was because of the time constraints to get this in before the zoning definition change was that neither the subdivision nor this road plan were designed in an ecologically sensitive matter, which is why the roads were never constructed. Because the road was not constructed, the municipality, as a condition of approving the subdivision, put a covenant on all the lots, locking them all together until such time as the road was constructed, which was really quite uneconomical to the the roads didn't follow uh, topography in a proper manner to make it. Well, you can always build it if you want to spend enough money, but it wasn't uh, economical. So it was at this point that my client bought the whole site and we started over. The new owner went through extensive rezoning on the basis of developing in a more ecologically sensitive manner to allow some smaller lots but no more lots, just the same number of lots. This is the first plan that I prepared, which uh, redesigned, or I shouldn't say redesigned, but reallocated where the roads were going to go, trying to follow the roads that had been surveyed before as much as possible. But it ended up there were lots of small overlapping slivers of closed road, road that stayed road, and new road being opened. Um, this created quite a lot of small slivers that were created, that were complex, to say the least. So Brian, back in 2001, you were just working with a CAD program. So um, what what was your process with just CAD and a COGO program for calculating all, all the little intricate shapes there that I can see you've had to document? Well, we had the shapes, so we would overlay them, and we would create points for all the intersections. And then I would take a print of the plan, a preliminary print, and then using COGO software, go around each parcel uh, uh, to achieve all, that all the information needed to close each parcel was there. 
right? You had to work your way around. And so, I, and I guess yeah. another big and challenge go, was sorry, and, and then go back and plot it on the plan properly, and back and forth, back and forth, quite a bit. Right. Okay. And I guess another big plan was you had to be really diligent about making sure you had all the necessary labels so that the next person could repeat your calculations. Exactly. And so, uh, and so that was the old way, and then you got into microsurvey. That's correct. And uh, microsurvey was just so much easier to do, um, and one of the one of my the tools I quite enjoy uh, using a lot is the lot closure tool. Uh, I use it so that when, when I'm doing it, I work strictly off the drawing um, and pluck or you know pick the points off the drawing, and it ensures that when I get a closure, that all the dimensions that are required are on the drawing. And it. Um, uh, Brian shared one of his drawings with me, and, I, and I've just zoomed in on one of the details uh, from Brian's plan here. And uh, I, I've just done a series of slides showing how, if this was done nowadays, um, how the lock closure tool would allow Brian to go through um, that that section of the exchange that's labeled A in his plan. And have a look at what's going on here. So um, we can see in this first slide that we're starting the uh, lot closure routine and we're creating a lot and we're, we're calling it exchange eight in this case and then uh, you can pick the drawing off the screen and or you can pick a point off the screen to start entering this lot closure. Now the reason that you've got a couple of options there, you've got store points and database and you've got uh, pick drawing to get location and draw lines and curves is because very often this routine is used the way we're showing it, where you're just selecting your labels right out of the CAD drawing, but it can also be used in an empty drawing if you've got a paper print at your side. Uh, sometimes people prefer to do it that way. So once you've started uh, defining this lot, then the next stage here is, uh, so you've got a choice of defining lines and curves. So here's uh, what you're prompted when you select line. And so notice how you've got the pick option on the side and that allows you to select the label right out of the drawing and populates the dialogue. Uh, you've also got the option of manually entering if for example you need to look at a detail or something where you don't have the label in the usual format or if you're looking at a paper plan then you can manually enter as well. So once you've typed in everything you need to define that straight line Notice how what it does now is you can see there's a purple line highlighting where that line is. And uh, if you're satisfied with it, then you just have pick, pick a pen to go on to the next section of the lot. Um, very often as you're entering these, you might find that the purple highlight goes, for example, 180 degrees the wrong way. And so that's the function of that swap button there that you see in the azimuth field. That allows you to just flick it around, and when it looks right, then you hit a pen. On to the next stage, so now we're defining our first curve, and so you, you notice how it's got the options for selecting uh, all the different elements that you need to define a curve. In British Columbia, um, curves are defined by their delta angle, and so I've got that checked on, and of course you can see how we have uh, picked uh, certain elements like the azimuth, the radial point, and the radius. We've just already picked those out of the drawing. On the next slide, uh, this was a feature that Brian really liked, so he wanted to make sure I highlighted it. You can use the uh, pick two option to pick two radial arc uh, labels, and it will calculate the delta for you. So uh, you've gone to pick two, you've selected the two radial azimuth labels, and then it gives you a feedback and it allows you to use swap if you need to, um, you know, and, and you get a little bit of a preview that shows what your delta would be if you picked OK. When you're happy with the result, you pick OK. And there the curve is designed. And again, it's highlighted in purple. Append takes us on to the next stage here. 
And so now we're starting to define the next arc. And uh, Brian's going to poke fun at me here because when I was putting this together, I, I misread his plan. And uh, so you can see that the purple line is just a little bit off. And of course, in the real world, that would just mean you go back and you fix the problem. And the other thing that I've shown in this highlight here is that I showed you the option of selecting the radius or using the pick for the radius. But in this case, the radius has been drawn on the arc, so I actually manually entered it. But is there anything else you have to make fun of me there, uh, Brian? You know, I think you highlighted the fact that you just picked the wrong pairing and then didn't fix it when you saw the, where the line went. Right. There you go. Rookie mistake. Okay, now we're just about finished, so now we're going to define the line. And again, you can see that offset that shows that I made that error before. Um, again, we're just using the pick option, and I've picked the two uh, labels right off the screen. Now, because I've got things off, um, it would be quite easy for me to just hit the previous button that you see there, because that actually allows me to cycle through the next segments and do edits if I like. And in fact, if, if I don't have everything and I actually need to go back and fix my drawing before I finish this, what I'll find is I can um, close this routine, make a few changes in the drawing, and then when I reopen it, this lot definition is already saved within the project. So all I have to do is pick it from the pull down and I can carry on editing it until I'm happy with it. Once I hit append and I pick finish, the next thing that comes up is a summary. It gives me a lot closure report, so we can already see that 1.5 meter misclosure. And uh, this gives me the chance to say no and go back and fix my mistake. Or in this case, if I pick on yes, then the final stage is it prints off a text document that is also saved with your project. That is a full written summary of the uh, lot closure. And in, in some jurisdictions, this is actually a requirement of a subdivision, and uh, so you can use that uh, to create your final report. So uh, some of the advantages of this routine, of course, I showed that you can pick the label from the drawing, so that, you know, uh, saves you on making keystroke error mistakes. Um, picking labels from the drawing also forces you to make sure that you've got your drawing labeled properly. If there's something missing, you just can't complete the routine. Uh, a big advantage was that purple highlight that I showed you, so you can uh, make sure that you've got your quadrants in the right place and your bearings going the right way, and you'll see very easily if there's a problem. Of course, the program automatically summarizes your closure, and it allows you to go back and make edits if uh, something is input incorrectly or labeled incorrectly. And the final resort is stored in your project so that, it, in fact, if you finish this routine and you close it and you need to revisit one of your closures, you can do that days later. It's all stored in the project. Okay, so now we're on to uh, the next uh, stage in Brian's process. Uh, Brian, go ahead and tell us what the purpose of this plan is. Well, this plan is now after the road exchanges has uh, been completed, uh, this plan uh, shows the, all the lots that have now been redesigned around the new access. And, and I can see here You'll notice how uh, Brian's used some lighter line work for the old lots, and here th this will stand out here. You can see the heavier line work for the newer lots that uh, were designed. Now, yeah. um, something that yeah. I remember you commented, Brian, was that with the old uh, CAD program, of course, it's a requirement in BC to use different line weights to show lines of different types. And so you've got heavier lines and you've got thinner lines. And I remember you commented one of the challenges with the old CAD program was that um, getting your labels not obscured by line, um, line weights was a bit of a problem. How, how did you use to handle that with the CAD program? Well, what, uh, what we would do is we would print the plan, uh, see what, line, uh, what lines were uh, overmarking the uh, the dimensions, and then reopen the the uh, CAD file 
and moved those dimensions a bit so that they wouldn't be overwritten. Now with microsurvey, the system defaults, you can pre-assign different text offsets. And we've got a little slideshow here showing some of the ways that you can use the, uh, the uh, labeling defaults. So you'll notice I've, I've zoomed in on a little uh, section of Brian's plan here where you can see there's a combination of heavy lines and light lines. And of course, Brian would have had to carefully move a lot of those dimension labels for the heavy line types. Um, something else that microsurvey labeling defaults allow you to do is uh, apply a scale factor or apply a prefix. You, you can see there's quite a few options, but we're just going to highlight um, two of them. So here's an example of a style number one that's been defined within the system defaults. So you'll notice how the text offset is 0.25. So this style is intended for lighter line weights. And this one also happens to have a scale factor applied to it so that the value of the dimension label will be scaled so that you can do essentially a grid to ground uh, scaling of your labels. And you've also got the option of applying a prefix or a suffix. And in this case, I'm applying a prefix to add ground just to make sure that everyone understands what it means. Here's another example. So we've got style number three defined. And this is one that is uh, intended for heavy line types. So if your CTB file is set up to print red as a heavy line, then we're making a little bit of extra clearance when we use that style. And you'll also note that this one does not have a scale factor applied, and it has a prefix of grid applied to it. So as you're doing your annotation, what you'll typically do once you've set up your labeling styles is you've got this little pull down in the MS Annotate menu. You can switch between the different styles just on the fly, and then you just go right in and you use some of the many um, survey annotation tools and the styles will be applied as you need them. Um, a, a big advantage of these labeling styles is that they're built into the microsurvey functions. They are not part of your CAD template. I know that with a pure CAD system you can do things like that but they have to be built into your template. So if at any point you get a drawing from somebody else that doesn't have those styles, there's a fairly long manual process of making sure all your styles are set up. With microsurvey, you save those styles um, as you're always going to want to use them, and then you, you can pull them into any CAD drawing. Um, it, in general, microsurvey has lots of annotation tools that are built around the idea that you save your defaults and layers, labeling styles, text styles, they will be added to the drawing as you require them. So you don't, again, you don't have to worry so much about having your template set up just perfectly. Okay, so Brian, on to the next plan here. Uh, go ahead and tell us what the purpose of uh, 1933 is. Well, this is the plan that actually creates the subdivision. Uh, you can see there's a fairly complex title on the left that um, is a result of many little pieces of closed road and uh, little pieces of opened road. Uh, it, it, it got fairly intense at points. Uh, we had many tables to summarize all the uh, various small ties on a large property. Uh, and, and so what, I, yeah, I, and I could see there was an awful lot of arithmetic you had to do. What, what was your process uh, back when you had a, a pure CAD solution for building the tables? Well, we generate the values using a separate program and then paste the results into the CAD drawing. Uh, with microsurvey, we can just, it's got some lovely routines for creating the tables uh, on the fly, uh, and uh, it works quite well. You can see the next slide for it. Yeah, there we go. And so, uh, yeah, we just did, uh, we've just zoomed in again on one of the details from Brian's plan, where you can see there's a 
natural boundary that has to be documented with a multi-tie table. And so you can see in the center image, um, this is the table that was created. You can see over on the left, uh, that's the multi-ties routine. And so what it what will allow you to do is uh, define your layer um, and then essentially just pick points out of the database and it'll automatically build the table for you. Um, my, that's one of the table tools that microsurvey includes and again they all work with your predefined labeling styles and your uh, your point database you can also generate line tables you can generate curve tables you can generate coordinate tables and in fact you've got the option for using multiple coordinate systems or you can mix lat long and uh, northings and eastings um, and you can also generate lot tables So on to the next slide. So what was the purpose of this plan, Brian? Well, this was, we were doing what's known as a block outline survey on this property, where the initial plan shows all the final dimensions uh, of the lots uh, with a certain amount of monumentation done. Um, not all the monumentation was put in originally because of it would all get, a lot of it would get destroyed with uh, construction. Uh, but the, but it did raise title. Uh, so then uh, sometime later, uh, in this case a little bit longer than normal, normally it would be within a year, um, we go back in and we put all the monumentation in on all the required points. Um, and that's what this plan shows is the final monumentation. So I, I can see in that detail, I mean, in BC, um, whenever you're going to indicate that an iron pin is going to be set, or an, I guess a newly set iron pin, they're typically shown as an open circle. And uh, what, what was your process with the Pure CAD program for inserting all those open circles? Well, we would just uh, place the symbol on, on the various points that were required, uh, and uh, at that time, uh, we had to make note of the scale, of course, for pl uh, plotting it. And then we would have to trim back the line work uh, with any of those open symbols. And then, uh, of course, what that does then is you can no longer snap on the line to get true dimensions because it's now been shortened. Uh, it was a less than perfect solution. Um, and I guess you also had to be really careful to ensure that your dimensions were in place before you did this. Exactly. Exactly. And if we had to update point positions uh, for any reason, you had to go through all those steps again. Uh, <laughs> that's the one that scares me. <laughs> yeah. And, and what I re quite like with microsurvey is uh, you can assign a wipeout symbol. I, I guess you can do that with some others as well, but using the auto map, it automatically plots and the, um, the symbol goes on and the line work uh, remains true to, the, to, true to form. Yeah, what, what we did was we did a little slideshow showing how now with the microsurvey system, what Brian would typically do is just add the field code for the symbol that he wanted at that point and it links the uh, the symbol to the database and so you can see as I zoom in there where uh, the old concrete post uh, symbol has automatically been inserted as soon as he types the field code and I, I did just a couple of examples of how you can customize your auto map to bring in the required symbols for your jurisdiction so here's one symbol where the old cap post symbol has already been inserted. Um, in this example, uh, I've, I've made it uh, look as though a bigger than usual symbol is required for that monument. And so you can see how you can adjust the label offset to make extra room for the text labels that are automatically inserted. I think Brian's pointed out that you in the end, you usually don't use the uh, point IDs and the descriptions from the database, but those are drawn on separate layers, and it's usually 
in, in Brian's practice, they're usually frozen before he produces the final plan. But for your convenience, it's really good to have them there for reference. I did another example of the automap entry that would be used for the iron pin symbols that uh, you saw in the, in the detail before. Notice how we're accessing a wipeout symbol. So all this is is this a symbol, a simple uh, block, and it has a wipeout in front of it, which is just hiding the line work that is still connecting to the point in behind. And so because he's using a wipeout symbol, the line is still drawn directly to the point. But more importantly, the line label has been derived from the database position for that point, so that if later on you know, Brian does a least squares adjustment or something and the points uh, adjust slightly, what will happen is the symbol re will retain its, uh, its appearance. Um, any significant changes to the dimensions will be reflected in the dimension that you already see there. It will actually automatically update. And so it saves him all that printed out and very carefully manually go through and changing all those steps. Uh, Brian and I had talked a little bit more about um, different things that he liked about microsurvey, and we're only able to highlight a few things. But uh, I, I just did a short final slide to, uh, about some of the other features that were worth mentioning. So we had touched on um, how you can apply uh, scale factors to labels, but you'll also find that Embedded Cat has a full um, support for either uh, producing points or for inquiring points and applying scale factors as required. So we have input scale factors, output scale factors. Uh, you can apply them to traverses, you can apply them to labels, you can apply them to, for example, offsets. Uh, you can apply them as you're inputting using the Kogo routines. As I'd also hinted, um, this is a full geodetic product. So your point database will be, all you have to do is assign a uh, Cartesian system to it. And from that point on, microsurvey can calculate scale factors. It can calculate deflection angles. It can calculate uh, an equivalent coordinate in a different system or in a lat long system. And you'll also notice that it's able to link you up to uh, Google Maps or to export a KML file. Uh, that's a very nice way of sharing information with a client. You've got the ability to edit traverses. Uh, you saw earlier James uh, did a demonstration of an import. If there was a field error, you can use the traverse editor to make corrections and to recompute. And as we pointed out before, um, if you recompute your point positions, that will update the database. That will update any line work and labels that are connected to the database. It all moves in a very smoothly integrated process. A few other tools that are valuable when you're working with the subdivision plan is very often you need uh, to solve some fairly complex area uh, problems. So we've got a, a full slate of area computation tools here. And in a really complex subdivision, sometimes it's really nice to have automatic lot creation tools. And uh, Brian didn't get to use them in the other project, but uh, sometimes you can do that. You can just, for example, set up a, a block and uh, give it a frontage and tell it to start creating lots for you automatically. And that takes us to the end of uh, Brian's portion. And, and so I did a little uh, Google Earth uh, screenshot just to show what the final result looks like. I, I am totally impressed by how physically large this overall plan is. It's, it looks like it's about a fifth of Whistler, in fact. So that, that would explain the pricing that Brian was talking about. So thanks very much for giving us that tour, Brian. Um, was there anything you wanted to say before we turn things over to James? Uh, no, I don't think I have anything to add. Uh, this was uh, quite an interesting site. Yeah, yeah, it sure was. Okay, so, um, so we're close to the end. So James is going to give us a little bit of a summary. And uh, at the end, we're going to have one short poll. And then we'll have a pause at the end, and uh, we'll be happy to ask, answer your questions. 
And uh, so it, again, remember that you've got the chat line. If you've got questions that you'd like Brian to answer, put them in there and we'll pull them out when we're done. Or if you have questions for staff. James, go ahead. And James, I think you may be muted. I am, in fact. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, okay, I'll just wrap up quickly with uh, a couple more slides. Once you purchase from Microsurvey, we want you to know that, that we are here to help. If you need a hand or have any questions, you can phone or email us. Jim and I bo both work in the technical support department, so there's a good chance you may speak with uh, him or myself personally. Brian calls in all the time, so we're very familiar with <laughs> talking to Brian. Um, the help desk is also a great resource, so that's uh, our help desk webpage. We've got many web articles and a large library of training movies uh, that cover all of our software. Also, you can sign up for a training class. We've got a network of trainers across North America who offer training classes in all of our products. And these training classes um, range from the fundamentals up to uh, advanced workflows. And there's also the user forum on our uh, help desk page as, as well, uh, where there's a good community of discussion there. So I can go to the last slide there, Jim. So what to expect in the future? Well, we, we listen to you. Uh, we're always trying to improve the software based on the requirements of the industry and the needs of our users. The Help Desk is a great resource for you guys to give us feedback based on your experience. We also work with Autodesk support, so if there's issues that we feel they need to be made aware of, we can contact them on your behalf. We also offer 30-day demos for both Embedded CAD and InCAD, um, as well as our other software. So this is going to let you try commitment-free to determine if the product, product fills a need in your business. And I also mentioned here that um, old versions can remain installed. This is something we get asked about a lot. Uh, so for you existing customers who are interested in updating but may have concerns about uh, setbacks during the transition period or, or time lost, you can feel free to keep your existing copy uh, installed alongside of 2018 as long as you see fit and then you can update at your own pace. And uh, the last feature that uh, I think those of you attending today are, are some of the first people to hear about is uh, we're planning on adding a new Bing Maps feature. So this is going to allow you to import free satellite imagery uh, from Bing Maps right into your drawing. Um, so this will be a really useful tool for showing, showing clients uh, areas and maybe working with field crews for uh, reconnaissance purposes. And that's everything I've got to say. We'll finish off now with one final poll. This is just a private one to give you some, uh, give us some feedback um, after you guys have seen the presentation. And uh, I will turn that over to Jim. And now feel free to ask us any questions in the chat, or uh, or there's also the the question box in the GoToWebinar interface. Thanks very much, everybody, for attending. We really appreciate it. All right, and that was a really fast response. I think that, uh, oh. I think I'm showing the wrong poll. Sorry, everybody. There's the poll. So obviously, if you guys don't don't wish to be contacted uh, directly after after this webinar, feel free to get a hold of us anytime if um, if you'd like to know a little bit more. All right, there we go. Okay, so I'll just close that poll. 
And next step is, um, hope we've got some, uh, so we've got, uh, we're open for questions now, and we've got our colleague, uh, Mark Vino, and he's been watching the chat line for questions. And so let's Thanks. Mark. Thanks, James. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Can. So one of the questions uh, that was asked today is, can you set up a local coordinate system and have it convert from, say, UTM to your local coordinate system? No. Um, <laughs> you're afraid you're, that some of these questions were going to be technical, and there was the first one. <laughs> um, you do have the ability to set up a user-defined coordinate system, which uh, would probably allow you to do that, but uh, you'd probably have to work with us to figure out what the parameters are. Let's see here. Does embedded CAD support shapefile import and export? We're, we're not there yet. Um, although um, we can display shapefiles in the background, um, but we can't, uh, add, we can't import or export them yet. This is, however, on the development roadmap. Next question. Can you export line work? to Google Earth? Yes. So uh, any any line work that's uh, basically what we call smart lines, so connected to points in the database as, as they would be if you uh, were using Kogo to enter, enter them, will be able to be exported to Google Earth. Next question. Is the embedded CAD AutoCAD LT version or is it a full AutoCAD version? It's AutoCAD OEM. Um, is the technical definition. Jim, I don't know if you know any more details of the differences between those two. When I've talked to people, I think they're almost identical. So yeah, people who are familiar with AutoCAD LT, you'll, you'll find you have pretty close to the same selection of AutoCAD tools. All right. What methods do you support for adjusting traverses in embedded CAD? Yeah, I remember that one. Um, if, you're, uh, if you've got a traverse, you've got all the standard methods for traverse adjustment. So you can do a compass rule, you can do an angle balance, uh, you can use the Crandall's method. Um, and and th these will work the way in a way that people are quite familiar with. There's a least squares adjustment option, or there's an export to Starnet for a more thorough least squares adjustment. And uh, the final one that I like telling people about is um, in the Traverse menu, there, there's a method that's called um, uh, Traverse Closure Old. That's what it's called. And what this routine allows you to do, people rarely find it, but it's really neat. It's really handy. It's kind of an old-fashioned force close method. So what it allows you to do is sort of type in a series of numbers that define what you want to be a closed lot and then give it a closing number and tell it, you know, uh, perform a balance around all those points. And so what it will do is it'll apply the compass rule to that series of points to force it to become a closed shape. And I, I find when I point that out to people who are just trying to make a lot work and trying to find an easy way to make things close, once they see that tool, they often do that. So a slightly non-traditional but a neat uh, traverse closure method. Can the Traverse Editor adjust prism constants? We do not have that ability, although we do have that ability in Starnet. A lot of our customers, rather than using Traverse Adjustment, will export to Starnet, and there's an inline option called the dot prism option in Starnet that allows you to specify a change in prism correction over a range of observations, and then you just bring it back into embedded CAD. I, th I think I've had users as well who would um, just make the change in their field software and then re-import the file back into embedded CAD. Oh, I hadn't realized you could do that. Okay, and and of course, if if it wasn't too much work, you can always you can edit the slope distances um, according to that small change, but that can be a manual process. Uh, can I exchange surfaces or alignments with Civil 3D? Yes, this one would be um, 
Land XML format would probably be the most common method to use to export a surface out of embedded CAD or, or NCAD and then import it into any other um, AutoCAD product. Yeah, any, any um, alignment or surface or parcels as well, I believe, they, they can be exchanged with uh, Civil 3D. And, and Brian, it might be interesting to get your comment because I know that uh, um, many of the drafters in McElhaney they use they already use Civil 3D or AutoCAD. Uh, do you run into many issues exchanging drawings with them? Uh, not really. Um, I don't really like opening their drawings only because I don't get points. I, it's okay if they send me a CSV file, but. Um, I don't like working with AutoCAD drawings personally, but that's just my own personal thing. Sure. Um, I like it when it's done in microsurvey, then it's very simple. Right, yeah. And they can certainly, they have no problem with my drawings. Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah, and, and if worse comes to worst, I suppose if they need your point database, you can do the same thing. You. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, Whenever I give them a drawing, I give them a CSV file as well. Perfect. All right. Mark, did any other questions come in? Um, I think we're pretty much wrapping up here. There was a couple of uh, Civil 3D sharing questions that you've kind of already touched on. Good. Um, being able to exchange with other people in the office. Will I have pro trouble working with anybody else's drawing if they're using Civil 3D? Uh, I don't think we touched on, can I view Civil 3D entities in Embedded CAD? Oh, that, right. Yeah, that we often get that question. Uh, yes, you can. There is an object enabler module that Autodesk publishes, and you can add it to Embedded CAD, and that allows you to open up a drawing from Civil 3D, and if they have, for example, surfaces or alignments or points, you can view them and uh, you, you can look at their properties as well if you need to add them to your database. Good. Well, that, yeah, th those are good questions. They actually covered the, the main topics. So I think we've come to the end of our discussion, uh, except for a chance just to say thank you very much to the audience for joining us. And a big thanks to Brian Brown for taking time from his busy practice to join us. And and for all the time you spent with me preparing for this. Thanks a lot, Brian. We sure appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. And thanks, James, for uh, so much organization you did in building this PowerPoint. And uh, things look really good. And thanks, um, for the audience, again, if we didn't answer your question, we've still got it in a spreadsheet. So we'll get back to you by email. And, of course, you can uh, reply uh, to the automatic email that you're going to get when this is finished. Uh, with any comments or with any requests for us to contact you. Thanks a lot for your time, and uh, we'll have this recording posted, or we'll have a recording of this session posted uh, within 24 hours. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Goodbye. everyone. Take care.